All right, thank you all very much for joining this evening for the Wednesday, December 15th Board of Directors meeting of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the chair, and we're having this meeting electronically and it's being recorded because of COVID-19. So I'll call the meeting to order and we'll start off with a roll call. Um, but just before we turn to the roll call, I'd like to take a moment to introduce new members. Um, so uh, Stephen Barr from the city of Littleton is here as the new member, I think he's here. Um, we now have Craig Hurst from the City of Commerce City as the member. He was the alternate prior to this, but now the full-time member. So welcome as the member, Craig. And uh, new alternates, we have Kyle Schlachter from the City of Littleton, Susan Noble from the City of Commerce City, and Bruce Baker from the City of Westminster. Normally, we can all get together, shake each other's hands, and introduce ourselves to the new members, um, trade phone numbers, and things like that. So it's kind of hard on Zoom, but I'm going to offer um, a suggestion with the post campaign um, new members and everything like that. If you are a municipality um, that is adjacent to or encompasses, in the case of counties, one of these areas that I've just listed, so it's Littleton, Commerce City, and Westminster for tonight please reach out to the new members and alternates and introduce yourself. And you can go to coffee together or something lovely like that because um, the more we know each other, the better this next year's tip cycle will go. Mm -hmm. So I would really encourage everybody who is adjacent to one of those municipalities that I've just listed with the new member to go ahead or if they encapsulate them as a county would encompass them, um, please reach out to the new members and introduce yourself and get together and get to know one another. And I suspect that in January, we will have another new round of members because sometimes it takes uh, a few meetings for the cities to appoint their new members. So we'll have this same challenge um, for the new members. Oh, and I love it. There's some exchange going on in the chat. So thank you all for doing that as well. So with that introduction, um, as I've mentioned, we'll continue to bring people over from the attendees to the panelists, but we will go ahead and Melinda will take the roll call. And if we miss you, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get it all sorted out at the end. Melinda, take it away. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, for our new members, we do announce um, our members in alphabetical order. So uh, just be prepared to unmute and let us know that you're here. All right, here we go. Aaron Brockett of Boulder. Present. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Chris Jordanelli of Brighton. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Mike Kaufman of Aurora. Bill Van Meter of RTD. Present. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. John Marriott of Arvada. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Cheryl Wink of Inglewood. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Here. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Present. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Present. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Present. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Here. <clears throat> George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Jim Dale of Golden. Here. James Kumerly of Lock Bowie. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Here. Joan Peck of Longmont. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Jackie Thomas of Decono. Kevin Flynn of Denver. I am here. Christopher Larson of Netherland. 
Larry Vidham of Bennett, Linda Montoya of Federal Heights, Celeste Arner of Federal Heights, <clears throat> Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Margo Ramson of Bomar. Michael Hillman of Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Oh, just from. Uh, oh. oh, someone may be unmuted. If you could please someone mute yourself. Unmuted, please yourself. <clears throat> Holly Rogan of Lyons. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Kevin Forget of Denver. Nick, Nicholas is here. Sorry, I just oh. actually went through and muted a whole bunch of people just to <laughs> clear the background noise. So just check your mute if you thought you were unmuted. All right, so we know that Nicholas is here. Thank you for that. Uh, Paul you. Sutton of Morrison. Sean Foray of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Toucher of Glendale. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Russell Stewart of Cherry Hills Village. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Rebecca White of CDOT. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Sally Chafee of CDOT. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Sarah Nirmella of Westminster. Lindsay Smith of Westminster. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here, good evening. Thank you. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. I'm here. Winshaw of Lone Tree. Here. Wonderful. Okay. And with that, I will hand it back to our chair to see if there's anyone that we missed during the roll call. Thank you. And we saw that George Teal, Joan Peck, and Nicholas Williams were all here, just to clarify. Anyone else um, that thinks we may have missed them in the attendance, please raise your hand. Steve Odoricio is here. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thank you so much. It looks like we have one more. Uh, uh, Randy Wheel is here as well, and we'll get him moved over. Madam Chair, Sally Daigle is also here. Excellent. Any last folks that think we may have missed them in the attendance, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, seeing none, if we do um, have any other cleanup to do, we will take care of that using the uh, participant panel, and um, the meeting minutes can reflect the appropriate attendance. Thank you, everyone. And so with that, could I please get a motion to approve the agenda? So move, Jim Dale. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Shaw? Second. Oh. Second. Thank you. Any other discussion of the agenda? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The agenda is approved. And that takes us to the report of the chair. And I will turn it over to the report from the Performance and Engagement Committee from Director Steve Conklin. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to thank the committee for meeting uh, two weeks ago on December 1st. We did not have a, uh, a work session that night, but the committee pulled together and, and met. And I really appreciate everyone's effort uh, in doing that. We had two topics. We talked about the Dr. Cog Awards. Uh, staff gave a presentation and we talked about what that's going to look like and look for announcements on that, I would imagine, coming fairly soon. Uh, and then also we talked about an eventual return to in-person meetings. 
And again, what that looks like and what conditions would need to be met for that to happen. And again, that'll happen at some point, hopefully in uh, 2022. Thank you, that's my report. Here, here, thank you for the report. And that takes us to a report from the Finance and Budget Committee from Director Winshaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Finance and Budget Committee met this evening um, and authorized uh, Dr. Cog's Executive Director Rex to execute a contract with RTD not to exceed $660,000 in 2022 in support of van pool services for the Way to Go program. This concludes my report. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And so I will take us to our next agenda item, which is a report from our Executive Director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good evening, everybody. It's good to see everyone. Um, I want to start this evening with the CDOT greenhouse gas uh, reduction rulemaking that's that's ongoing right now. Um, just so you all know, the commission is expected to take action on that rule at, at their uh, meeting tomorrow morning. Um, you know, in the packet, there was a revised uh, greenhouse gas rule, um, and it was an update from the October 19th version that we have saw we, we saw and we talked about last month. And we provided additional comments. Um, I would like to highlight just a couple of the changes in the in in the in the latest and greatest version. Um, that address some of those comments. So the first, it adds a requirement that CDOT and the MPOs prepare a publish and publish a calibration and validation report document of the model components and key parameters. Uh, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. We already do that. So that's obviously good news. Um, also, it, it, the, the, the new proposed rule draft uh, revises language in the preamble, allowing more flexibility for operational improvements as uh, mitigation measures. As you remember, that was one of our comments that we had that we wanted to continue to be able to, um, to provide and allow for signal coordination in our region, for example, which is a, uh, which is a program with Dr. Coggs and we think is uh, very valuable to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it also clarifies language in the compliance section, allowing for waivers and reconsiderations at any time. And last but certainly not least, was uh, it revises the VMT per capita reporting language to require uh, additional data such as economic conditions, population growth, EV registrations, transit ridership, and bicycle use to provide uh, more context and removes the automatic trigger if VMT per capita uh, does not decrease uh, for three consecutive years. Um, it does not require the, the commission to open the, uh, the rule. Um, so that was also a, a comment that we had as well. So uh, I think all in all, um, you know, we're following it closely and we will obviously be on the, be on the, uh, the video tomorrow to make sure that all goes well. Uh, I also want to mention that we had a MetroVision Idea Exchange um, on December 9th. And for those that are new members, um, these Idea Exchanges is a, is a series that provides a forum where Dr. Cox planning partners and other stakeholders share information and ideas identify local and regional successes, as well as emerging and ongoing challenges and actions uh, to address them, them. Last week's session focused on local governments and um, how they develop and use population projections uh, to inform their planning and infrastructure related priorities. Um, so uh, if you'd like to see and hear the presentations and discussion that went on in that session, and we have a video recording of that on our website, just go to the, to the events calendar um, under December 9th and just pull up that meeting and you, you'll ha have access to that recording. Um, I would like to truly thank the staff of Adams County, uh, Bennett and Littleton for their time in working with Dr. Cog and preparing for this event and sharing their innovative work uh, with the audience that on, on the 9th. So thank you so very, very much. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, I would like to take an opportunity just to thank the board members as, as you mentioned earlier that will be rolling off the Dr. Cog board at the end of this month. Um, I know there are several, including I know Director um, Aaron Brockett uh, from Boulder um, is, uh, is rolling off, as well as Director Jim Dale from Golden, and I'm sure there are others on the call uh, that might be doing so as well. I wanna thank you also very, very much for your commitment to this region and doing all that you, do, you have done and will continue to do to make this region the best place to, in the country to live, work, and play. So thank you also very much. And, and personally, I want to thank you. Thank you all for, for your friendship and and again, your your just attention to uh, to the, the big big issues that we have in our region. Um, on a on a more sovereign sobering note, um, 
I wanted to mention a life, the passing of a lifelong friend of Dr. Cog, uh, uh, Bob Briggs. Some of you may, may know Bob. Um, he, uh, he passed away on December 2nd. Uh, he had several involvements with Dr. Cog mostly through the years. He was a very strong advocate of regional transportation planning. Um, he also served on the Dr. Cog board when he was Adams County Commissioner back in the early 80s. Um, he was passionate about transit alternatives specifically, uh, especially trains. He was on the RTD, he was an RTD board member and lifelong uh, proponent of the Rocky Mountain Rail Authority. Um, and then in 2004, he received a regional leadership award from Dr. Cog, um, and which basically um, when he was a state representative for his support of regional transportation. So please keep um, his family um, in your thoughts. He's a, he was a fine gentleman from everything that I hear. I've never had a chance to meet him, but, uh, but his, but, uh, but everything I hear, especially from Rich Morrow, Mitch Rich dealt with him quite a bit. Uh, he's, he sounded like quite, quite a guy. Um, I would like to share a little bit of staff news with you all this evening. Um, I wanted to share that, that um, Brad Calvert, our regional planning and development director is moving on from Dr. Cog. Um, I know it, I'm, I'm gutted by it, but I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to get through it, Brad. No, he, uh, yeah, as you know, he's, he was, he's been here for 11 plus years, exemplary work. He's just, he's just a tremendous gentleman. And I'm so happy to have an opportunity to work and serve with him at Dr. Cog. He has accepted a position in the, in the city of Steamboat Springs. Um, his last day will be February 3rd. Um, just, I'm sure you don't know this, but Brad, had, Brad has had a place in Steamboat for several years now. And this was just, a, just an opportunity to make that his permanent home. I guess the mountains truly do call. And um, so we wish Brad nothing but the best. And um, Brad has been, again, a tremendous asset to this agency and region during his tenure. And I've uh, committed to him that we will continue to march, to continue our march to uh, making the outcomes identified in Metro Vision a reality. So, and I know he'll be checking up on us uh, for sure. So Brad, thank you, sir, so very much. Um, we still got him for, for a month and a half. So, um, so we're, gonna, we're gonna work him. Uh, last but not least, Madam Chair, I would like to um, thank or, or wish everybody on behalf of Dr. Cog's staff a safe and happy holiday season. And, and here's the 2022. I got a feeling this is going to be our year. So, uh, so cross your fingers and we'll hope to see everybody in person real soon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's my report. Thank you for most of those updates, Executive Director Rex. I, I know uh, there, there will be time at the end of the meeting for outgoing members um, if they want to make any comments. So in the other matters by members, we'll take some time there. And I know we've all worked really closely with Brad over time. And so um, I'm so happy for him personally. And that's great news, but I'm very sad for us. So it actually ruined my day when Doug told me that. So I have to go through the stages of grief and deal with it on my own time frame. Um, thank you for your report, Executive Director Rex, and that takes us to our public comment period. Um, up to 45 minutes is now allocated for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that no public comment will be on issues for uh, a matter which we've held prior public hearing, um, and we will start consent and action immediately after public comment. Are there any members that would care to comment? And just again, you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the panel. All right, seeing none, that takes us to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Director Levy. Is there a second, Director Peck? I second the motion. Thank you, any discussion of the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. That takes us to our action items this evening. Our first action item is to select representatives to serve on RTC Stack E470 and the ACA. If you'll go to attachment C in your packet, you'll be able to see the information there. And I'll just take you through it really quickly um, and then turn it over to Executive Director Rex if you would like to add anything. So on the uh, ACA candidates, um, we have the exact number of candidates and spaces. So Director Shaw and Director Conklin uh, would be able to serve us in that capacity. And uh, for the Regional Transportation Committee, we have the exact number of candidates as we have spaces. So Director Shaw and Director Levy would be able to serve us in that capacity. 
For the STAC, uh, State Transportation Advisory Committee, we got three applicants, but my understanding from talking to um, Deborah Mulvey from Director Mulvey today is that she would be able to help us out over on the E-470 board so that we would have service over there, which would leave uh, Nicholas Williams and Director Maurer to be able to serve us on the STAC. And uh, Tammy has been the alternate on the stack. And so she would move up to the member and Nicholas would become the alternate. And then if we continue down the list, um, we would have then not had anyone for E470. So we offer many, many thanks to Director Mulvey for doing that important service for us. So with that, we have the uh, exact number of people as we have spaces, and we would still have a few vacancies in the alternates. Um, it's my understanding, and we'll, we'll go to members and other folks if they First, we'll go to the people who have been nominated to make any comments if they'd like to, but then we'll go to other members. But it's my understanding um, that Director Teal would be willing to serve as the alternate on the E-470 board if he could just confirm that. And once we hear all of those things, we can, since there's the exact number of people, as there are spaces, we can vote um, to nominate all of those people who have put themselves forward to serve in those roles for us. So with that explanation, First, I'll turn it over to Executive Director Rex to see if he has anything he'd like to add. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I will just say that um, we're always looking for alternates for the Regional Transportation Committee. So if there are those, and we have we have limited number, or unlimited number we can have for, for that. So if you're interested in serving as an alternate in the event that we're, we're in, a, we're in a, a situation where we need to call alternates, we would appreciate that. And so you can let um, Doug Rex know that by emailing him after the meeting, that will work for that. And so would any of the members who've put themselves out there and taken the time to volunteer for these additional duties like to make any comments this evening? And if you just raise your hand, if you would like to, and Director Teal. Madam Chair, I'd be happy to serve as the alternate to um, represent Dr. Cog on E-470. And it would be an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much. And Director Mulvey. Hi, uh, yes, it's my pleasure to serve where needed. And uh, when I saw that that Tammy and um, Nicholas put their names in and their qualifications in service far exceeded mine, I'm more than happy to have them represent us so much more adequately than I could on the stack. So I appreciate that. And thank you for allowing me to serve where you need me to. Thank you, Director Mulvey, and you would do a great job on the stack as well. So we just really appreciate that you're willing to do the extra work. And Director Mauer? Um, uh, thank you, um, Director Mulvey, for saying that. And I just want to say I'm honored to serve on stack. And um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Director Mauer. Director Williams? And I'll just echo uh, Director Maurer, very excited to to serve and to to work and and be Director Maurer's alternate and and yeah, kudos to um, uh, Director Mulvey and yeah, don't say yourself so short. I think you did an excellent job, but thank you guys. Thank you all, and seriously, very very sincerely, want to thank all the members who have put themselves out there for extra duties. I think everybody realizes the extra commitment we all have on Dr. Cog with the two meetings a month and normal in normal times driving down to Denver and all of that or taking the bus down to Denver. Um, but having these extra duties is an additional round of meetings and responsibilities. So um, putting yourselves out there to help our region is really wonderful. And all of these different committees we serve on have a huge impact to the people of the region. Um, whether it's getting our folks a fair share of money from the state or representing people on important um, funding decisions or transportation and mobility decisions on these various committees and um, this making sure that we're taking adequate care of our, our older population and um, looking after everyone. So thank you. It's uh, tremendous work that's done and I really uh, sincerely appreciate everyone who's gone out for it. Any other members care to make any comments or is there any other discussion on this item? Madam Chair, if I may, real quick, before you yes. take a vote. Uh, I I just wanted to thank you for your service on Stack for over the past year. Um, it was, it, it, you were great. You kept us in communication all the time and uh, we appreciate you. So I just wanted to share that with the group. Thanks, Executive Director X. Any other comments from folks? All right, so I will move that we uh, nom that we appoint the members as presented this evening. Is there a second? Second. Teal, seconds. Do you have any discussion of the motion? 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And that takes us to our next uh, action item tonight. And that is the discussion of the Front Range Passenger or passenger Rail District Board nomination and appointment process. And I'll turn it to Jacob Rieger, our Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. And if you want to follow along in the packet, it's attachment D. Good evening, Jacob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Give me just a second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully folks are seeing the agenda memo for this, uh, this item, as well as my lovely blue tinted glasses for some reason. So um, <laughs> didn't wanna do a PowerPoint for you tonight, but I would like to use the memo as, as sort of a means to kind of help you walk through this. So we've started an initial conversation with you and with the Performance and Engagement Committee regarding the new Front Range Rail uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail District that was created by Senate Bill 238. So we wanna dig into this a little bit deeper this evening. Uh, we actually do have this as an action item as we're asking for a couple things uh, from you to keep going on the work that we need to do here. Um, but I wanna start with just a little bit of background uh, regarding the new uh, Front Range Passenger Rail District, again, that was created uh, by Senate Bill 238 and our representation on that district. So hopefully as you see on my screen with the memo, um, the new Front Range Rail District will replace the current uh, Front Range Passenger Rail Commission on which I serve. Um, the new district, as you see in the middle here, um, kind of stretches, you know, really from border to border, and it will have 24 members in its board of directors, and 17 of those will be voting members. And we broke down the composition of those 17 members, and I'm not going to go through all 17, but I do want to highlight a couple of these. Um, the governor himself will appoint six directors. Um, one of those directors will be a, as it says, a resident of a city or county um, in our region with an unfinished fast tracks rail service uh, project that's in the legislation. And then Dr. Cog directly, we get four members um, on this Front Range Rail District Board. And then our companion uh, metropolitan and rural transportation planning organizations um, around the state also have membership as well. Um, and then you see that CDOT, our class one railroads, uh, RTD, um, others, the I-70 Mountain Corridor Coalition, other folks also get to make appointments to uh, the Front Range Rail District Board. So again, specifically when it comes to Dr. Cog, as I said, we have four um, director slots that we need to appoint um, to the Front Range Rail District Board. We need to do that by March 1st of 2022. Um, and as it says at the bottom of, of the one page, the new district board, um, according to the legislation, will convene its first meeting no later than mid-May um, of next year. So a little bit of detail from the legislation from Senate Bill 238 around um, our appointments. Um, and we've tried to bracket this out for you here that appointees must be a current or former member um, of our board um, within our MPR, Metropolitan Planning Organization planning area. Um, so that's, in, that's our entire region, except uh, Gilpin County, Clear Creek County, and any municipality east of Kiowa Creek and Adams and Arapahoe counties. Um, those areas are outside our MPO planning boundary. Um, and so they're also outside of this district boundary. When we do get to the point, when you all get to the point of actually making our appointments to the Front Range Rail District Board, only members of the Dr. Cog Board who represent member local governments within our MPO planning area um, can take part in that vote. So again, that excludes those same areas that I just mentioned above. The terms are four years for our district, um, our district uh, board members, except that two of the initial appointments will be for two years. So two folks will, will start serving for two years, and two years, two folks will start serving for four years. Um, and then finally, as I said, um, our appointments are due by March 1st, um, and they are subject to state Senate confirmation. So with that background, we had an initial conversation with uh, Performance and Engagement Committee um, back at their August meeting. Um, I think the big thing that came out of that in terms of just some initial conversation, initial input was to use um, their recommendation to use the now current um, nominating committee as the sort of engine, the, the mechanism to start this process for soliciting and recommending to you all um, candidates for, uh, for our four slots on the Front Range Rail District Board. So specifically, we're asking for two things from you tonight as, as a, uh, in the motion, um, and I bulleted out those here. So first is to authorize the nominating committee to lead the process to identify and recommend Dr. Cog's Front Range Rail District Board candidates, and then authorize staff to work with the nominating committee to develop an application for the candidate solicitation process. Other appointees around the state uh, will need to go through the boards and commissions um, process on the state uh, on the state's website, the, the sort of mechanism for applying 
uh, for the Front Range Rail District Board. Uh, we've reviewed that as staff as, as well as, you know, in terms of the types of questions that are asked. And we think that there's some good information in there that we may want to consider in putting together an application. But substantively, um, again, working with the nominating committee to come up with the application, we do anticipate that the substantive things that we'd like to ask about, um, of course, the candidate's background and transportation issues, interest in passenger rail generally, but really specifically interest in front range rail, specifically from a regional perspective, representing Dr. Cog on the new district board. Um, and that's really important to take that regional perspective because there's a lot of obviously important issues that touch and affect the entire region um, that, that our folks will have to deal with on this board. So with that background and with that information, here is the motion that we're asking, authorize the Dr. Cog nominating committee to recommend candidates for Dr. Cog's representatives on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board and to authorize staff to work with the nominating committee to develop an application for the candidate solicitation process. Um, so that's really all I have and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And so um, we can take questions and comments and also at any time someone can make a motion and that will not end debate. Um, so people don't have to feel like they're cutting one another off uh, and we can continue to ask questions after there's a motion on the floor. Director Brockett. Well, I thought I just might make a motion. So uh, I will move that we authorize the Dr. Cog nominating committee to recommend candidates for Dr. Cog's representatives on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board and authorize staff to work with the nominating committee to develop an application for the candidate solicitation process. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Odoricio? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I would like to second that, but I do have one question. Are we allowed to nominate um, alternates as well, or does it have to be primary? I'll turn it Wait. over to staff to answer the question. Director Rieger? My understanding is the legislation doesn't speak of alternates that we're actually um, recommending and eventually you're taking action on just four candidates to serve on the board. Sounds good. So as long as we leave it open, I would love to second this. Great. And then I'll just turn it back to Director Brockett. Did you want to speak to the motion at all or have any other questions, Director Brockett? Oh, just looking forward to the formation of this board and the work that it does. Thank you very much. Director Teal? I think this is a good process to follow. I mean, it matches up with what we do for uh, nominating our executive officers. I, I think it's a, a good way to go and I speak in favor of the motion. Thank you very much. Any other discussion or questions before we take a vote? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? And the abstentions. Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And so we'll move on to our informational briefings tonight. We have the draft FY 2022 to 2027 tip policy call for project applications. Todd Guttrell, our senior transportation planner in transportation planning and operations will tell us about this. Good evening, Todd. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone. Uh, so this evening, we are bringing forth a draft of our tip policy and two applications. Um, so the draft of these documents are included within your packet. And just for your information, um, today we are talking about uh, draft versions of these documents, but next month we will be bringing these along uh, for your recommendation to take action to adopt these uh, in hopes that at the end of uh, January, we're able to release our first call for projects. So let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, so first of all, we just wanted to provide a very high level overview of the TIP policy document. Um, so like I said, that document is included within your packet. Uh, it is in track changes. And I think over kind of overall, one of the largest changes that we have made is we have removed the reference to any TIP years. Um, so staff is meeting for this document going forward is to use this for all future calls. Um, so this will limit um, our need to essentially readopt a new document every four years when we traditionally would do a call for projects. We simply can just continue to amend this document um, before calls for projects take place. Um, of course, we will still seek input both on a technical and on a policy level um, like we have always done before calls for projects are issued. Um, so the remaining changes are outlined um, along with the chapters. Uh, so the first chapter is simply just an introduction, uh, but we have updated the TIP schedule and, and have made this more generalized 
um, for the common good. So it doesn't necessarily follow a month and a year, um, but we'll just follow along that X process will take so many months. Uh, so for chapter two, for roles and requirements. Um, so overall, uh, with the passage of the new federal transportation bill, uh, we have cleaned up the funding sources that sort of go along with that. Uh, we have also um, taken a look and updated the capital project eligibility, meaning those projects that are currently reside within the current RTP. And if a sponsor is interested in taking one of those projects from the RTP to fund it in the TIP, uh, this would outline how and what those projects would be eligible for. Uh, we've also updated um, language within the technology of projects and then also the freight section. Um, so by cleaning up and expanding some of this language uh, for the technology projects, um, relating it back to the regional operations plan and systems engineering analysis, and then for the freight, just have added, added language related to the economy, reliability, and emissions. So within chapter three, which is the initial program programming that Dr. Cog undertakes, um, we have again updated some of this language concerning funding and in accordance to the new federal transportation bill. Uh, we've also updated based on your previous discussions, the set aside programs, and also I have removed um, two previous other commitments that were also uh, within the TIP policy. Um, one concerning Central 70, which has been completed. And then for the fast tracks commitments, um, there are still two outstanding corridors that have yet to receive their funding, but we are working with those corridor partners to fund them, uh, certainly before we get to the 24 to 27 tip. So chapter four outlines the calls for projects. Again, this is both the regional share and the sub-regional share. Uh, before, but before we get into those shares, uh, we have replaced um, the tip focus areas, which would which were in your previous TIP policy with the current RTP project and program investment priorities. Again, there, there was a previous discussion uh, item at a previous board meeting on this. Uh, we've also updated and clarified the match language with the multimodal options fund. So when we get into the regional share, we've updated the intent of what the regional share is, uh, basically linking this to um, the MetroVision objectives and outcomes. Um, for the funding, specifically the match within the regional share. Um, previously, there was a requirement to um, have a 50% match um, that has been reduced down to 20%. Um, we've also updated the eligibility requirements for projects and programs um, that would be submitted under the share. Uh, and we've also noted the parallel track applications, um, which again, we previously had discussed um, last month at your board work session. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few slides. Uh, continuing with the sub-regional share, uh, we've updated the funding targets uh, that, uh, with updated data. Um, the funding targets, um, as you know, within the sub-regional share um, is further targeted to each individual forum um, so that there's current data to go along with those funding targets. Uh, very similar to the regional share, we have updated the eligibility requirements for projects um, that are looking to submit within the sub-regional share. Um, within the forums, uh, we've updated language that simply says that if you're looking to take an action um, as a forum that must be completed during a meeting that is being held, whether in person or virtual. Um, again, noted the parallel track applications and have simplified the submittal process for this share. Um, essentially, these applications will be coming to Dr. Cog first. Um, this will certainly help out the, um, your technical staff in the ability to go through uh, and score these projects and eventually make a recommendation. Chapter five outlines the development of the actual TIP document and the amendment process on that, doc that document would undertake. So within the TIP amendments and TIP uh, or mo administrative modifications, uh, we have refined and clarified some of that language in terms of what actually triggers those amendments. Uh, and we've also inserted language that says, um, if we're in the middle of two calls and there happens to be a funding increase, and if we believe a new call for projects needs to be issued, we would go out and seek Dr. Kaga board approval before that takes place. Uh, and finally, within Appendix A, um, which contains the selection processes for RTD and CDOT, uh, we have updated their processes uh, to reflect what they are currently doing. All right, so next we can move into the TIP applications themselves. 
Um, so as I previously mentioned, uh, there were, we did have a discussion at your no, uh, November work session uh, on the concept uh, of getting into these two applications um, is really the matter of using two different applications in accordance to the funding programs that we have. So the first application uh, we're simply calling the STBG or surface transportation block grant application. Uh, and this uses this funding program uh, to fund eligible projects under that funding type. The second application, uh, which we're calling the air quality multimodal application, uses a combination of state and then three federal sources, combining these sources together uh, to be able to help reduce the required match of those multimodal funds um, and uh, make a complete package and along the way, using those certain funds to lower the actual match along uh, for certain projects. The main key difference between these two applications is that the air quality and multimodal application um, excludes uh, roadway capacity projects, roadway reconstruction projects, and bridge projects, uh, essentially those project types that do not improve um, congestion or air quality. So the basic application structure is broken down into four sections, um, A through D, um, and we'll go through, the, go through these one by one uh, individually here. So section A is the regional impact of the proposed project. Uh, so this is very, very similar to what you would have seen in the application four years ago, which at that time was called regional significance. And the proposed weight by staff for this section is 30%. Um, so some of the questions and, and the focus of those questions um, are simply, well, you know, what is the importance of your project? Um, is your project solving a regional or sub-regional, if it's a sub-regional application problem? Um, what is the impact um, on disproportionately impacted and environmental justice populations? And of course, questions that surround, you know, is the project going to make progress towards the outcomes within MetroVision? Um, within the first section and the sec second section, so sections A and B, um, the responses required are narrative. Um, some of these narrative responses will require a quantitative uh, information to go along with that narrative response. Um, so especially within se section A, uh, again, some of those require that information, but some do not. Uh, so as we move into the second section, which again is the MetroVision Regional Transportation Priorities, um, proposed section weight is 50%. And essentially there's questions asking, you know, how does my project address each of these six priority investment areas? Um, so all of the responses within this section are, again, a narrative response and do require a quantitative um, data to be included within that narrative answer. Section C is project leveraging or how much overmatch or matches your project providing. Uh, proposed section weight is 10%. Um, and again, your score is based on on the percentage of outside funds that you're bringing towards um, your total project cost. So section D is a new section uh, called project readiness with a proposed section weight of 10%. And what we're trying to accomplish within this section is to screen for um, common issues and pitfalls that may happen um, along, you know, throughout your project life, but especially trying to capture what those may be um, before your project uh, even may receive funds. Um, a lot of these items are things that really project sponsors should already be aware of um, and certainly you know, being reviewed before they're actually being submitted within the application. So some of the questions may surround you know, to identify and mitigate any potential roadblocks. You know, what is the current status of your right-of-way? Um, what is the availability, availability of your matching funds? You know, is it contained within a a current CIP, um, what sort of public engagement have you, have you done to date? Um, most of these answers that we're looking at, um, there's a series of check boxes and descriptions within this section to really try to gather the full context of what is actually happening uh, before the application is submitted. Uh, proposed scoring. Uh, so each question will be scored on a scale of, of zero to five. Uh, and just as important of scoring those individual questions, it is also looked at relative to other projects that are received. Um, and so certainly if you're looking for, uh, you know, to be considered for the full points, 
uh, you certainly would want to fill out um, these check boxes and data tables within the actual application. Um, so finally, just to sort of wrap it up, there's some other things to remember here. Um, so Dr. Cog's staff is developing a data application, which certainly we hope will assist sponsors um, to develop and um, gather some of this project data for the app application. Um, as sponsors are developing their cost estimates and sort of going through, you know, all of the elements of their projects, um, they typically would develop key phases and kind of understand a, a timeline of when those milestone, milestones would be hit. Um, so we are asking that that information be contained within the actual application. Also, as part of the application package, we're requiring that a cost estimate in year of expenditure dollars would be provided uh, within that application package. Um, within the project readiness section, uh, if you are looking to certainly improve your score, we would certainly recommend having a licensed engineer review the information within the application um, just to make sure that um, those impacts and there's some mitigation factors that have and are available to certain aspects like utilities, right away, um, railroads, environmental, those things um, are taking place and at least there's been a mitigation measures that have taken place. And then in conclusion, sort of what we would, we would normally say to every project sponsor who's thinking about submitting an application, um, typically the more time and energy and the funding that is spent upfront to develop an application, that typically will help you more in the long run. Um, certainly when we're talking about cost overruns, project delays, or thinking about a schedule, now, certainly we understand that there's always things that happen that are unavoidable. Um, COVID-19 is a perfect example. But again, the more energy and time spent now um, in the application process to going through these projects, certainly we see a correlation where that helps in the back end. So um, I believe that is all the information that I have today on these. Uh, and like I said, we will bring these back um, next month uh, seeking approval of these documents. Be happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you very much, Todd. Questions and comments from members, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks, Todd, uh, for a very informative uh, and concise PowerPoint. And um, I read the document, so I learned a lot. <laughs> it was actually very <laughs> instructive to, to read the whole attachment and um, get the whole, uh, the whole flow of it. I just had a question about um, it, well, it's page 64 of the packet. It would be page eight of the uh, of the TIP plan, uh, planning and policy document itself, as you've got it redlined. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with, uh, it, it's the section um, two funding assessment. It, are, are you on the page yet or do you need a yes. sec? Yes, yep. okay. I'm following along with you. Okay, great. So where it talks about Dr. Cog reserves the authority to program some funding um, before the regional and sub-regional share um, calls opens. Just wondering, I guess two questions, is that current practice and um, what is, would the decision-making process be for that? Would, would that be brought to the board? Uh, just a little more elaboration on that, please. Right. And I think what we were trying to capture is certain activities that may take place before the typical regional and sub-regional share process. So uh, one perfect example may be um, our current soon-to-be allocation, I should say, of the Multimodal Options Fund. Um, we do have those funds sitting out there, and we are currently going through the waitlist process um, right now to be able to allocate those funds. So the statement certainly can reflect an activity like that, but we are trying to capture anything that may happen. And certainly we're not trying to say circumvent the, the committee and the board process um, to seek their authority. So maybe this is reflected elsewhere, but it, it um, might be good to Add some language um, indicating that um, that the the board will be advised of those decisions or something to that effect. I think Certainly. just to make that clear. 
Um, and then also, I just wanted to point out what I think is a typo a little bit farther down um, on the one, two, three, four, fourth bullet point um, on the Dr. Cog through its calls for projects, funds, projects with, and then the carbon reduction program funds. It says that support a reduction in transportation reductions. And I think you meant emissions there. Exactly. Thank you so much. We'll make those changes. All right. And just think of you as me as your proofreader in chief. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Director. Thank you, Director Levy. Director Mauer. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering, Todd, I just and this is just um, looking at the application. Has there ever been a consideration to put something in there? Um, does the agency that you know would be doing this project, do they have staff available or will they for overseeing projects with federal funding? Um, just so that gives them a heads up that there's some more complexity to it. And so they don't get caught unaware. And because sometimes, you know, that, well, not sometimes, most times it adds a cost to your project to do those things. So I was just wondering if that is considered, you know, part of the application of giving them a heads up and being prepared. No, uh, certainly director. I, I think from a staff perspective, we've always made the assumption that there is going to be staff available and they understand the process. Um, but I think that would be very suitable to put within the application, uh, perhaps in that project readiness section. Okay, thanks, Todd. Thank you very much, Director Maurer and um, Director Papsdorf. Thank you, Chair Stolzman. I just wanted to um, amplify one, one point related to Director Maurer's question, and that is that we, we also provide um, training to all potential project sponsors at the beginning of the TIP process, and um, that train uh, attendance to that training by staff from any sponsor is actually a prerequisite to being eligible to apply for TIP funding. And um, Director Maurer, that, that sort of staff oversight, staff requirement on the, on the local agency side is, is definitely one of those things that we uh, discuss in those training sessions. Thank you very much. And if my power goes out, Director Flynn, you're taking over. Just a little friendly reminder with some high winds and flickering on my end. Director Teal. Well, thank God I don't have to take over. <laughs> Todd, a uh, question pertaining to the uh, license engineer review in order to determine uh, shovel ready. Um, does that have to be a uh, outside engineer review or can that be a staff engineer review? Uh, no, certainly we would encourage that to be whomever um, the applicant believes is most available. So if that happens to be internal, um, great. I, I think the question really came about with conversations with CDOT um, and they have noticed that some applications are more developed from a planner perspective and sometimes lack the engineering perspective. Um, now so that's certainly okay for some project types um, but we wanted to make sure from an applicant point of view that at least from an engineering point of view, somebody had reviewed it. And again, it kind of goes back to the whole notion that the more time spent now reviewing these potential issues or flagging them at least uh, will help every project in the long run, hopefully do better. Okay, Roger that, thank you. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Thank you, yeah. I I tend to try to view this having in mind that we are a whole region with diverse areas and projects. And I appreciate all the time that went into it. At the same time, I'm, I've said before that I sometimes am dismayed by the focus on the six MVRTP categories because they it's hard for some localities to squeeze into those and find um, adequate narratives or adequate criteria, even though there is substantial need and um, for the funding and substantial need for the projects. So, you know, with that caveat, I, I don't know how to get around that 
I've never found a way and I appreciate all that's gone into it. And the other factors that have been inserted in here that allow for those things that don't fit in there to be considered. So thank you for that and for hearing my two cents again. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Um, Todd, did you want to, want to reply at all or add anything in? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I'm, I mean, maybe Ron will, but I, I don't think anything from my perspective. Director Papstorf? Yeah, um, Chair Solzman, Director Mulvey, Ron Papstorf again, Transportation Planning uh, Division Director. Certainly understand the point. I, I think I would, I would respectfully say, I think just about any project um, um, fits somehow within the six investment priorities that are identified in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. And the second, the second more important point is to keep in mind that the money that's directed by Dr. Cog through the TIP process uh, to fund investments in the transportation system represent a, a very, very small fraction of all the resources that get invested in transportation. Uh, through CDOT and RTE and even and local jurisdictions. And this, this is the region's opportunity to invest in those projects that will advance towards our implementation of the regional transportation plan and the goals that that plan is meant to, meant to address for the region to address very, very challenging transportation issues. Director Mulvey, did you wanna add anything else or have any other questions or comments? Uh, no, I, I don't have much to add, except that I certainly appreciate that. That adds an additional color that I hadn't really been thinking about. So thank you. Thank you. And any other members have any comments or additions or questions they'd like to see before we vote on it next time? If you think of something in the middle of the night, don't worry, you haven't missed your opportunity. You can email Todd Cottrell and his information has been included in the packet here for you all. So. Thank you very much. And getting back up to my agenda. Uh, boy, where are we? Okay, committee reports. Um, the stack didn't meet. Metro Mayor's Caucus isn't here this evening to report, but we'll get it next time. CDOT's also not here as the advisory aging uh, committee on aging. So we'll catch up with those next time. So the first report will come from the RAC, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Uh, the RAC did meet on Friday, December 3rd. It was a pretty light agenda, uh, although important. We did approve the 2022 budget and work program for the agency. And uh, we also had a discussion about uh, emission control strategies, both here within the state and other states. Um, it was very interesting to learn what other states are doing as we look to, uh, uh, we start to begin to look for mitigation measures for the upcoming, um, uh, uh, State, state implementation plan, part, part of uh, our ongoing efforts to improve air quality in this region. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And now we have a report from E470, Director Dyack. Um, Director Dyack, you're on mute. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> uh, we, we had two items. One was the approval of the 2022 budget uh, about $270 million in revenue, as well as $130 million in capital improvements, uh, largely to start our back office software rewrites and also start our expansion of uh, I-70 to 104th. Uh, that'll, that'll take us to 2024. Uh, we also uh, approved an Adams County Trail IGA. Uh, E-470 is partnering with Adams County to build approximately 2.5 mile uh, five miles of trail uh, in the Riverdale Bluffs Regional Park. And with that, that is all, thank you. Thank you very much. And Bill Van Meter, a report on Fast Tracks? Mm, nothing really to report. The November board meeting had no actions directly related to Fast Tracks and the December, there are no December regular board meetings for the RTD board. Wonderful, thank you all for the committee reports. And so um, in your packet, you will find there are some informational items, the TIP administrative modifications and the advanced mobility partnership annual update. And so those are attachment F and G respectively. 
Our next meeting is January 19th, 2022. And I'd like to take this time to open the floor to other matters by members and turn it to any um, members with any matters at all. But of course, give the outgoing members a chance to say anything if they'd like to at this time. Um, Director Brockett. Thanks for that, uh, Chair Stolzman. So I uh, just wanted to say farewell to everybody. Um, I've enjoyed serving on this board so much. I, I've done it for six years, almost to the day. It's been an incredibly rewarding experience. I've learned a lot and just so much admire and respect. Um, uh, Doug, you uh, as the leader of the organization and all of the extremely capable staff of Dr. Cog, it's been an honor and a pleasure to work with you and all of the dedicated elected representatives who give so much time to making our region a better place. So thanks for uh, allowing me to, to serve with you and um, I'll say goodbye for now, but look forward to seeing you all in other regional forums and continuing to work together. Thanks so much. Thank you, Director Brockett. Director Baker. Madam Chair, with your permission, I'd like to give an update on MAC, the Metro oh. Area County Commissioners. Thank you, please. I'm so sorry that I skipped over that. I did not. I that was on no the problem, no problem. No problem. Sincerely. It's, it's just that we did have an all day fall retreat on December the 3rd at the Grant Humphreys Mansion. This was um, sponsored by Adams County, which has um, held the, the chair. Um, Eva, Hen Eva Henry from Adams County has led MAC during this year. And the outcome of that full day fall retreat was a very extensive strategic map of where we want to go in uh, 2022. Um, among that's too uh, extensive to go into much detail here, but if you uh, any of the municipalities would like uh, to see what Mac is is doing, I'm sure we can share that uh, strategic map with anyone that asks for it. Just talk to one of your county commissioners. Um, the, in 2022, the chair will be uh, from Arapahoe County, vice chair will be from Boulder, and the second vice chair will be from Broomfield. Uh, we will have monthly meetings. We'll have two in-person meetings in uh, 2022, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Are there any other matters by members? Director Dale. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to echo the comments that my friend and colleague, Director Mayor Aaron Brockett's made. It, this has definitely been a, pl a pleasure and honor for me to get to know so many people and to learn so much about transportation and get a chance to be on the aging advi advisory committee for the aging. And I will continue to do that as member at large, but thank you for all uh, your humor, your friendship, and your teaching, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure and honor, and I'll see you around. Thank you, Director Dale. Director Brockett. I just couldn't resist saying that the best present you could give us at our last meeting was ending early, so thank you so much for that. <laughs> I was trying, I actually had a personal goal. It's, I'm close, but not exactly on target. So that was supposed to be the holiday gift to everyone with some of your life back. So with that, seeing no other hands raised, we'll see you all in January and the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, I'll be safe. Thanks everybody. Goodbye, happy holidays. <laughs>